that would be great. Great. Um, so this is this might be familiar to those who are joining us for you know the second or third time. Um, but some housekeeping information. So the code that I'll be sharing today uh, will be made available on GitHub. So the GitHub repository looks something like that. Uh, it has both the complete version of the Cordo document that has all of the code written in. And then there's also the blank version that you can uh, fill in as we go along, uh, in addition to the data set that we'll be loading in and using today. And for those who are choosing to create a copy of my project, uh, my repository on Posit Cloud, and you want to um, follow along there, just know that your project uh, on Posit Cloud is going to be deleted after two weeks. So if you um, want to keep it uh, for longer than that, just make sure to export it um, if you want to keep a local copy. And I just want to acknowledge that this workshop um, was co-developed um, or was originally developed for the Na National Research Council of Canada's uh, Women in Science and Innovation Coding Group. And I'm presenting an adapted version of that today. All right, so uh, for those, uh, well, it's been two weeks since our last workshop. So let's maybe take some time to review what we learned last time. So we were introduced to this idea of R packages. And packages we saw can contain code, uh, functions that we can use namely, uh, documentation, and also sample data in a standardized format that can be easily installed and loaded into the workspace by the users. We also uh, were introduced to the Tidyverse, which is a collection of popular R packages. And we can refer to these collection of packages as a meta package. And Tidyverse specifically is designed for data science. Um, of the two, Tidyverse packages, the ones that we examined were ggplot and the plier. Uh, ggplot mainly used for data visualization and the plier mainly being used for data manipulation. And we started exploring um, how to build basic plots in ggplot. And we saw that creating a ggplot object or plot is like building a layered cake. We start with uh, the ggplot function call we provide it with the data that we want to visualize. And then we uh, add some sort of geome, whether that's geome bar, geome line, to create your bar plots, line plots, respectively. And these two components were required, so your data and the type of, and, and specifying the type of plot that you want to make. And then we also saw, saw that you could add additional layers to change the look and feel of our plots. So I believe we didn't have enough time to finish um, off the last exercise uh, for bar plot. So we'll kind of start today by diving back into that. So the first thing that I want to do is to read in the data from last class. Oops. So I'm using the read CSV function. And the name of the CSV file that I want to uh, make available in my workspace is called frenchtrains.csv. And I am just going to store that in a variable named data so I can access it easily. OK, I think that loaded. Let's check. OK. So this is exactly the same um, as the data that we looked at last time. Uh, just to, just as a quick refresher, uh, each row summarizes information on trips from, on, on train journeys or trips from one station to another for a given month and year. So for example, if we examine the first row, uh, this captures information on trips from Aix en Provence to uh, the arrival station Paris Lyon 
for the month of, sorry to go back and forth, but for the month of uh, January in 2015. So our first exercise for today is to um, create a grouped bar plot to compare the number of departures from Paris Nord in 2015 and 2016 by destination. So last time we created we created bar plots, but we didn't get a chance to look further into grouped bar plots. So that's what we're going to start off with today. So I am going to start off with my data of interest. And I am just going to select um, the columns that are relevant to this question, just so that um, I don't overwhelm my my little uh, window with information that's not completely relevant to the question that we want to answer. So I know I need uh, the departure station column, the arrival station column. I need the year and total number of trips. Oh, actually, let's do month as well. Now I also want to apply a filter because we're only concerned with train departures from Paris Nord in the years 2015 and 2016. So I'm gonna use um, the filter function from the deplier package. And the first filter I'm gonna apply is this. I want to make sure that my departure station is Paris Nord and make sure that you're using two equal signs here. And I also want to make sure that the year value for my observation is either in 2015 or 2016. So that is the notation that I'm using. I'm doing like percentage sign in percentage sign and then specifying a numeric vector that contains my years of interest. So I'm just going to do that, run that. Okay, looks good. All my departure stations look like Paris Nord. And yeah, I'm seeing the year 2015, which is promising. Oh, there's a typo. Okay, so now I should have both 2015 and 2016 in my data, great. And one little trick I'm gonna do before we pass our data into ggplot is that I'm gonna mutate um, our year column. So right now our year column is of type numeric or double, but I want to change it to a factor uh, to better capture the fact that year is is categorical in that sense, in that if we have like a, a value of 2015.2 or 2015.7 doesn't really make sense in this context since we're only looking at uh, year, which you know, would be uh, whole numbers. So uh, in order to change the data type of the year column, I am going to use the as factor function. So basically saying that I want uh, my year column or yeah, I want to, I want to turn my year, year column uh, to is type factor and just overriding whatever we have in the year column right now. Okay, so now we see that year is of type factor. Now I want to get the total number of departures um, from Paris Nord in 2015 and 2016, but the observations that we have right now give us the monthly um, sums. So we need to do a bit of uh, math <laughs> to get the total number of departures per year. So I'm going to group by year and arrival station and then use another deplier function called summarize to sum the total number of trips uh, for given year and arrival station. And I'm just going to specify 
at this argument dot groups uh, equals drop uh, to remove this grouping that I perform performed earlier. Okay, so that looks reasonable. Um, it looks like there are uh, four different places you can get to from Paris Nord. And for each year and each uh, arrival station, we have the total number of journeys that took place. So we we summed across the, the months basically um, with this operation. So the data looks good. Um, and I think we're ready to pass it into the ggplot function now. So I'm going to uh, pass this data using the pipe into ggplot. And I am going to call the AES function to specify or to map what I want along my x-axis and my y-axis and so on. So along my x-axis, I want my arrival station, my y, which would be the height of the height of each bar, should be mapped to n, which is the total number of journeys. And since we are creating a grouped bar plot and we're going to have um, multiple bars for each arrival station, I want to use the, the color of the bar to basically communicate. These are the numbers from 2015 and these are the numbers from 2016. So to do that, I'm going to use a fill argument and pass in year. So data from 2015 is going to have one color. Data from 2016 is going to be of another uh, bar of a different color. You'll see that in a second. So I'm just going to run that to make sure I don't have any typos. OK, looks good. I have an empty grid. I have my arrival station down the bottom. That looks promising. OK, now I want to create a bar plot. So I'm going to use the geom bar function. Once again, Statting my setting my stat argument to identity to basically just tell our um, yeah the height of the bar. You can just take the value in n as is. There's no comp additional computation that needs to be performed. And then specifying the position argument is dodge. And when I press enter, you'll see that you you have two bars. Uh, for each arrival station, one representing the total number of journeys in 2015, and then the other representing the total number of journeys in 2016. And, and Dodge basically just specifies ggplot to put these two bars for each arrival station side by side. Now I can also save this bar plot. Uh, I'm saving it to a variable named bar underscore plot. And we can create a horizontal bar plot with just one additional line of code. OK, so that's our current bar plot. If we add the um, function chord flip, what this is going to do is flip the Cartesian coordinates. And boom, you have a horizontal bar plot um, that displays the exact same type of same information. Um, I think it's helpful to know how to create a vertical and horizontal bar plot just because you might want to use one. Um, you, you might want to use one in some situations and the other in other situations. Okay, um, any questions that I need to answer in the chat? Oh, um, I, I saw that one uh, person is having uh, difficulties reading in the CSV. Um, I think there may have been a typo. It's French trains. So make sure that um, it's you, you have the plural form of trains. And if you are on Posit Cloud like I am, um, you you can see the full CSV name here as well. Okay, uh, why did I change years to type uh, factor? I think it actually might be easier to show you what happens if I don't do it. So I'm just commenting out the line where I change year to type factor. It looks a bit funky because R basically tries to interpret year as 
a continuous variable and um, yeah, th this isn't exactly what we want. I'm not not sure if any of the, the co-hosts have a better way of explaining the need to change um, year to a factor or categorical variable here. Maybe not? Okay, moving on. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we, we covered the basics of, you know, building a scatter plot, bar plot, line plot, and so on. Um, but the cool thing about R and ggplot is that it's quite easy to change the look and feel of your plots with like relatively few additional lines of code. So we can go back to the bar plot that we made earlier. It looks something like that right now. Um, but perhaps you're not really interested in this color scheme that we have right now, which is like the salmon pink and this tur turquoise. So if we want to change it, we can add the scale fill manual function and to the values argument, pass in the hex codes or character strings representing colors into, into this vector. So we have, we have two colors that we want to replace. So I'm going to use two sets of hex codes. I'm going to copy it in the chat if people don't want to type. These are the official um, colors of the French National Railway Network, I believe. So yeah, if you if you're creating a if you're creating a ggplot um, for your organization and you want to make sure that the color scheme matches whatever visual identity or style guide that your organization has, you can use um, functions like scale fill manual for bar, box, and violin plots, and scale color manual uh, for scatter and line plots if you want to spec if you want to change the colors manually like so. Um, if you are in need of some, let's say like inspiration and you're not really sure what kind of color palettes you should use or you're not really sure what kind of colors work well together, um, there are pack many R packages that can help you do that. One being the R color brewer package. And I think this one um, is integrated qual quite well with ggplot too. So I think I have this package already loaded into my workspace. So in order to display um, all of the palettes that are contained within the R brewer package, I can use this function display.brewerall. And it's, let's pop this out, okay. It's a little squished, but you can see that uh, it comes with like pre-coded um, palettes, one that, um, how, what do you call these? Um, continuous or sequential where the opacity or like the strength of the color um, is lighter on one end and then you have like the much like darker version on the other. And then down here you have what's called like a diverging palette. If you want to, let's say like create a heat map and, and you want a diverging uh, color palette to specify like really hot areas versus very cold areas. And then you also have um, this these sets of color palettes in the middle that can be used to represent categorical um, information. You see that like there's, there's no trend there's no um there's no trend unlike the color palettes up top or on the bottom in that the, the colors are um is kind of a hodgepodge of, of different colors okay so um let's try changing our bar plot uh using this these pre-coded um palettes from the r color brewer package so Sorry, I'm just going to open this up again. So we're working with categorical uh, information here. So I think I want to pick a palette from this, this middle section. So I think I want to pick pastel one, which is the one you see right here. So what I can do then is use the scale fill, not manual, but brewer this time. 
And then in the palette argument, I'm going to specify the name of the palette that I want. So it's pastel one. And boom, um, I was able to change the color palette or the colors used in my plot using the pre-coded color palettes in the R Color Brewer package. And in terms of accessibility, um, one thing that is uh, important to to keep in mind is that um, a there are uh, people who are uh, colorblind and may have trouble um, uh, interpreting plots with certain sets of colors. So this R, what another cool thing about this R Color Brewer package is that they have a specific, um, or when you add one specific argument to the function that we used earlier, you can retrieve um, sets of colorblind friendly palettes. So. Going back to the display dot brewer all function that we looked at earlier, you can already see here there is a argument called color blind friendly. And if I set that to true and I run this function again, so it gives me a new um, it gives me different sets of color palettes again, but you see that there are fewer palettes than what we saw last time. Um, and again, like these are combinations of colors when used together um, should be accessible to those with color blindness. So if I want to uh, recreate that bar plot using color blind friendly um, color combinations, you know, maybe I want to use set two, the one, this one down here. So again, starting with my original bar plot and using the scale fill brewer function like last time, but then setting it to set two, which we know is a color blind friendly uh, color plot palette. And yeah, we have a new plot here. Okay, I'm just gonna check the chat. Oh, um, to zoom into the color palette, um, on the top right corner of the plot, you'll see like three buttons. One is a, a square with a small arrow next to it. And if I click on that, that um, brings up whatever image you have in a different window. And you can zoom into it easily as well. Yeah, in terms of reordering the arrival stations in the bar plot, let's say in like non-alphabetical order, um, I would recommend I would I would recommend setting your cities to type factor and then specifying the order that you want those cities to appear as factor levels. Um I can quickly share a function that would allow you to do that. Just give me a second. Maybe the fact level function from Forecats, which is a tidyverse package that allows you to uh, manipulate like the order of factor levels, or fact reorder might be helpful to use in that case. Yeah, but anyway, I think I would start off by converting your arrival station variable from type character to type factor, and then using the factor levels uh, to, min to basically specify the order. Um, yeah, that, that, that you want basically appearing on your plot. And yeah, recoloring individual bars. Um, I'm not too familiar with that. I think 
when we when we try to apply a color palette, like you kind of do it all at once. In in terms of recoloring individual bars, the closest thing I can think of is what we first went over, which is to individually specify um, exactly what we want each bar to be. So unfortunately, I can't comment much uh, too much on um, changing the color of the bars individually. Okay. So moving on, um, we're just going to go over um, a few different types of plots. Okay, so uh, okay, introducing a new plot. Now what we're going to do is uh, to create a bar plot that shows the distribution of the monthly number of trips from Paris, Gare de Lyon, uh, for each international destination. So we're going to start with our uh, data, same same data as before. And we are going to use the pliers filter function to just retrieve the observations that we're interested in visualizing. So in this case, our departure station of interest is Paris Leon. And there is this variable called service in our data, and we can use that international to retrieve uh, international services, since those observations are the ones that we're going to be plotting here. OK, great. So that looks like it um, decreased the number, decreased the number of rows. It makes sense that um these arrival stations would be classified as international service since I'm seeing city names that um, aren't found in France. <laughs> All right. So I think we're ready to um, pass this data into the ggplot function. And again, using AES function to um, map the x and y coordinates. I want arrival station along my x-axis and the total number of trips along my y-axis here. Okay, that looks good. So I, I want four sets of um, box plots here, basically, one for each arrival station. And the geome that we're going to use here is geome box plot. And we don't need any additional arguments here, I think. Okay, so it looks like um when you when you compare the distribution of the monthly number of trips from Paris to Gen Geneva Geneva I'm guessing somewhere in Italy Lausanne and Zurich so different places in Switzerland and Italy it looks like on on average um there are or I guess that's technically the median that's being shown uh there are the most num you're more likely to see, um, or services to Geneva are you know more frequently occurring than services to Italy. That's sort of what I'm taking away from these box plots here. And we can also just change one line of code to visualize these distributions uh, using a violin plot. So I'm just going to copy the first what, four lines of code here, and I'm going to paste it down here. And instead of using geome box plot, I'm going to use geome violin. And it basically shows um, similar information. However, to quote like the uh, violin plot article from Wikipedia, in some cases, uh, the violin plot can be more informative than a plain box plot because as we saw earlier the box plot really only shows um only visualizes summary statistics like the median um the interquartile range and outliers and whatnot whereas the violin plot kind of sh uh gives you a better idea of the full distribution of the data and one important thing here i think is that 
uh, violin plots can be particularly useful when the data distribution is multimodal or ha has more than one peak. So, you know, in terms of setting it up, very similar, um, but depending on um, what it is that you want to convey, uh, it may be useful to use box plots in one situation, and it may be uh, useful to use violin plots in another situation. I'm just going to check the chat. Okay. No questions. Great. Okay, so then let's try creating more plots. <laughs> Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is to create a line plot to show how the monthly number of trips from Paris to multiple cities in Brittany, uh, which is a region in France, uh, how the monthly number of trips from Paris like fluctuate over time. And this time we're going to use facets to organize multiple line plots into a panel. So last time uh, we worked with multiple lines, but we we had it plotted like on the same plot, but this time we're going to use facets to organize them into more of like a grid. So uh, first I want to create a character vector that's, got, that's going to contain the cities and Brittany that we're interested in. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, assign that to a variable named Brittany cities. The cities of interest are Ren, Rest, and Campe. And the reason why I know this is that I uh, took a peek at the data earlier, just to save us some time during the demo. And I'm just going to copy and paste uh, that vector into the chat um, in case people just want to copy and paste it into their workspace. Oops. Just gonna run that. Make sure that that. Okay, great. It's in my workspace now. So again, starting with my data. Uh, since we are interested in the monthly number of trips from Paris, I am going to use the filter function. Uh, to only retrieve observations where the departure station is Paris Montparnasse. I will copy and paste that into the chat. And then I want my arrival station to be one of these three variables or values. Brittany cities. And I'm just going to run that to make sure that my data was filtered correctly. OK, year looks OK, no, year doesn't matter here. Um, departure station is all Paris. OK, and arrival station, I'm only seeing one of the three cities that we have uh, defined in this vector. Great. OK, so I think we're ready to pass our data into the ggplot function. Okay, so uh, we want to show month. Okay, the monthly number of trips, how it fluctuates over time. So we want um, the months going along the x-axis here, and then we want to show the monthly number of trips along the y-axis. Okay, and then we're gonna have um, like a grid, a panel for each year, but we want to convey the different information for the different arrival stations um, as different, co differently colored lines. So I am going to set the color argument to the arrival station column. Okay, I'm not seeing anything there. Then I'm first going to call G uh, add geom line since we're creating a line plot here. Okay, now this looks this looks a little funky, but if we add facet wrap vars year, you see that it basically um created four line plots, one for each year, 
and you can see how the monthly number of trips uh, from Paris to Brest, Campe, and Rennes uh, fluctuated over a given year, basically. And I would do a little bit of manipulation to make sure that um, we don't have, you know, two and a half, seven and a half um, as labels along the x-axis since we're we're talking about months ideally i'd want you know whole numbers um but just for the interest of time i'm going to skip that today um but i basically wanted to show that show how to use this facet wrap function uh and and how it can help in and and how like basically organizing a sequence of panels in this way uh, could be an appropriate use of screen space in some cases when you when you don't have a lot of space to work with. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, um converting your ear variable Maybe you forgot to wrap year in vars. The vars function basically tells um, ggplot, I want my facets to be done by year. Like I want um, a subplot for each year. Filter. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure about that error message. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to hop uh, over to the next question. Anything to say about the Magret pipe versus native pipe? Um, I am just using the Magret R pipe because that is the default pipe I get when I use the, the pipe shortcut in Posit Cloud. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. Okay, to, to, to dig a little further into how we can further change the look and feel of our plots. All right, so uh, this is similar to one of the bar plots that we created last class, except we're just gonna do a little bit more um, uh, tweaking to change the look and feel of the plot. So I'm gonna start with my data. Um, okay, so the same arrival and departure station as the last question, so I'm setting my departure station to Paris Montparnasse, and my arrival station should be one of the cities in Brittany. Okay. And then I am using uh, this date variable. Putting that on my x-axis, setting my y-axis to the total number of trips, and using color to convey the different information for the different arrival stations. And then I'm going to geomline. Oops, it's not. There we go. OK, it looks something like this. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is to force the axis, y axis, to start at zero. Right now, it's maybe somewhere around 100, but we wanted to start at zero just so that um, we can clearly communicate where, where that baseline is. So, in order to do that, I am going to use a scale y continuous function, and I'm going to use the limits argument. I want my y axis to start at zero, and I want it to go up to maybe 700. That should be good. And I'm also going to use the expand argument to, to, to make the y axis limits tight. OK, so now we see that. We force the y axis to start at zero and it ends at around 700. Great. 
The second thing that we want to do is to add year month labels to the X axis. So we are going to use a scale X date function to manipulate that since we're tweaking the scale of the X axis and our X axis uh, contains data of type date. So that's sort of how you remember uh, which function that you want to use. Okay, um, there is a argument called date breaks that allows you to specify how frequently you want labels appearing along your axis. And what's really nice is that you can just type like four months as a character and, and it'll figure that out under the hood. And date labels, um, these are shortcuts that you can look up. Um, but basically by using sharp, sorry, percentage sign B space percentage sign capital Y, um, it gives you the abbreviated month name followed by the full year. Now, um, the labels are a little, they, they overlap here. So we're going to come back to that in a little bit uh, in order to make the labels a little bit more legible. And I think the last thing that I want to do here, oh, okay, sorry, two more things I want to do. I also want to maybe change the look and feel of this plot by applying um, a pre-existing ggplot theme. So ggplot has a couple of complete themes. So for example, theme gray, theme black and white, uh, theme light, theme dark. You can you can see how each theme uh, drastically changes the overall look and feel of the plot. And maybe uh, for whatever reason, I want to use the aesthetics associated with theme minimal here. And in order to do that, I am just going to add theme minimal. And you can see that, yeah, it, it looks like it removed the background color that was in um that was behind the lines and, and the plot does look a little bit more minimalistic. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly save or uh, yeah, save this plot to a variable so we can do further manipulations with it. Oops, did I make a spelling error? Oh, double T. Okay, great. Now, the last thing that uh, we want to try doing here is to change the elements that are specified by the theme. So these are, um, and what I mean by this is that there is another function that you can add to your plot called theme, and in it, uh, there are many arguments that you can pass in order to change um, you know, the size of your x-axis label, the uh, rotation of the words along the side. Like basically, um, all the bells and whistles that aren't uh, that don't directly that aren't directly associated with the underlying data, sort of the stuff that, that goes um, along the exterior of the plot, let's say. So if, let's say, I want to remove um, the title of my x-axis date, since I think, given the labels, it's pretty obvious that I'm, I have date labels here, I could use the axis.title.x argument set that to element blank, and you'll see that that'll remove um, the date label that we had down here. And we kind of talked about how these labels are hard to read since they're overlapping, but don't worry, we can rotate it. So uh, the part of the plot that we are trying to change here maps to axis text x, so the text um, the, the labels along the x-axis. And we can use the element text function. 
And let's say we want these labels to be on a slight angle. And then let's just adjust the, um, where it starts horizontally. And you can see that we were able to rotate the labels to make it a little bit easier to read. OK, so um, that, yeah, that, they, that basically is just like an introduction to um, show you how you can modify the theme using this theme function to customize like the non-data components of your plot. And I've made a note here, but if you are using, if, if you are planning on using a pre-coded, like pre-specified theme, but you also want to change um, these non-data components in addition to that, you have to make sure that you do those uh, modifications after you call theme minimal, theme black and white, or whatever, or else whatever specifications that you provide are going to be overridden by whatever is the default for that uh, complete pre-coded theme. OK. And yeah, I think the, the last thing that I kind of want to share here is that, so we have this, we have this theme. Um, these are two ways that we want to change the theme, basically. And what you can do is save it to a variable, let's say, called theme custom, so that any time down the road, um, if you want to make these same modifications, you don't have to type theme access title X, access text X. And again, and again, and again, you can just save it uh, to a variable and then add that to whatever ggplot you're trying to, to modify. Basically saves you um, a lot of typing. And it also can be helpful when you're trying to like systematically make the same changes across multiple plots in your work. Okay, I'm just, I see that there's a couple questions in the chat, so I'm gonna. Okay, it looks like it's been resolved by the co-hosts. Great. Um, the last thing I think I wanna just talk about is you know, you've made all these plots. You probably want to know how you can save them. Uh, so you could, you know, ex export it or you know, embed it in an email, use it elsewhere. Um, don't worry, there is a function for that. It's called ggsave, like that. Um, so let's try saving this plot here, which is what you're seeing down there, basically. So we can use the argument file name to specify what we want the file name to be. So maybe Brittany trains.png. Um, there's a few different file types that GG save supports, I believe, but I'll just use PNG for now. Uh, in the plot argument, you can pass the variable name that is storing the plot that you want to export. So in my case, it is Brittany PLT. And then I can also provide a full, or no, I, I'm not going to go over that today. I'll just do that. And then it should create a copy in yeah the root of my directory here. Yeah, and uh, if you are lazy, you don't necessarily have to specify uh, or provide an input to the plot argument. Um, if you don't do that, the ggplot gg save function is just going to save the last plot that was displayed in your environment. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just going to quickly go over some resources um, that I thought were really helpful and that I still use to this day. Because to be honest, like I don't. Um, have all of this memorized. I often have to do a lot of Googling and things like that. So I'm going to just share some links that I think are super helpful. The first is data to from data to viz. 
what's really cool about this is that if you're, let's say, unsure about what kind of visualization is is best for uh, the story that you want to try to communicate, it gives you um, a bunch of options. Uh, so for example, if I click on histogram, uh, it also provides you with a bunch of demo, like sample code using ggplot. So if you click on one that looks interesting, uh, it'll show you exactly uh, what code is necessary 